Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar. We have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to listen to it on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email to everybody who registered for the event that will contain a link to the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during the presentation you have a question, please don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question, and we will take, uh, we'll at least be taking about 10 minutes near the end of the presentation and go over audience questions. We may do a couple here and there throughout the presentation as well. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is flow metrics, what they are and why you need them. Our speaker today is Dominica de Grandis, who's Director of Digital Transformation at TaskTop. Hi, Dominica, how are you? Good to see you. I think I, I don't see you yet, but I, there you oh, are. Yeah. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> great, great. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn things over to you and let you start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. I just turned my webcam on for a moment. This is where I spent a lot of time writing and um, and working. Um, but so, but today I'm really excited because I'm going to be talking about flow metrics, one of my very favorite topics. I'm going to describe and present what they are, why they matter, you know, how you gain them, and what benefits they provide to you. And so, with that, I'm just going to turn my camera off now, and we'll focus on the on the presentation. And so basically what we're saying here, move the next slide on, is that we have no lack of data collection and information visualization approaches at our disposal. There's, there's lots of data. The problem is that at the business level, there's no compelling set of abstractions for what to visualize. Contrast this to the available telemetry with teams practicing DevOps. You know, they know their mean time to recover rates. They know their change success rates. And those help them identify what opportunities to improve. If you look at development teams that are using Scrum or Kanban boards, they can make all their work in progress visible across the entire team. And that helps them see if the team is overloaded or not, or whether they need to reduce their WIP limits. It's the business level organization. It's the business level visibility that organizations lack. And this is what flow metrics provide because they're tied to the business value. So flow metrics bring visibility to outcomes. For example, oh, you know, only feature work got done last week or last month or last quarter. We didn't fix any technical debt. And oh, by the way, that feature that was delivered last month was delivered one week later than big customer expected. So outcome-based metrics provide a feedback loop to improve decisions. You know, should we allocate more capacity to fix tech debt next month? Or should we continue to allocate teams to do more features? You know, we, don't, we don't know, that depends on the strategy of, of the organization and decisions that are made on the business side. But these are the kinds of important questions that flow metrics provoke. And IT can play a good role here in providing business leaders with metrics to better understand the trade-offs from decisions they make. For example, if we go another release without fixing any technical debt, what's that going to do to the happiness factor of our employees? Is it gonna make it really hard for them to maintain their code? It's also important, I wanna also note that flow metrics in general uses the language that both IT and business people can understand. Like time, you know, when can big customer use this feature? That's a speed question, which brings us to our first metric of flow time. Flow time is a measure of speed. So flow time is the duration it's the elapsed time that it takes from when work enters the value stream to when it's considered done. And that time frame might be different depending on the team. One team might consider something done when it's delivered to the customer. Another team might consider something done or not done until 
it's already been delivered and a few months have gone by to determine if there's been any value that could be derived from that change. It just, it just depends. This visual here shows three different types of speed metrics, delivery lead time, flow time, and lead time. Lead time is measured from when a customer first makes a request. This is the time that customers care about. Delivery lead time is measured from code commit to done. And this is a good measure to see how your delivery pipeline automation is improving or not. It measures what we call the right side of the value stream. Flow time is a term I started using I don't know, maybe three, four years ago. I didn't make it up. It's been around since John Little proofed out Little's Law in the 1960s. But I just got tired of hearing people go to war over Twitter on the differences between cycle time and lead time. Cycle time is such an ambiguous term. You know, it has multiple definitions depending on if you're in manufacturing or software. And so in my workshops, while I was helping people make their work visible and find bottlenecks and optimize their workflow. This is the work I do. It's the work I love the most. I thought, you know, just start the clock wherever it makes sense to in your context. It's your value stream. At what point do you want the clock to start? And I learned that a lot of business people and product owners were actually interested in how long it took to do something once they decided that it would be a good thing to do which is what you see in this illustration here. Once business people have decided, yes, let's do this, we approve this, go forward and, and, and do this. And so that's why I started using flow time when talking about speed metrics in general, because it starts the discussion on what time frame is most important to measure for your organization. And also flow is attuned with lean and Kanban, and I'm a big Kanban fan and flow is a pillar of lean. You know, I just realized that I probably used the word flow about 25 times and haven't defined it yet. So let me do that. Flow is value that's pulled through a value stream smoothly and predictably. Flow is actually the first way of DevOps and DevOps relies on body of knowledge from lean and theory of constraints. Theory of constraints is the study of, of bottlenecks. So enough about what flow time is, how do we measure it, or why do we measure it? Well, for a number of reasons. One is because people complain that things take too long. So when people complain that things take too long, it's a good thing to measure, right? So you can see if you're improving it, you know, to see, well, how long are things actually taking? And if indeed they are taking way too long, then measuring the flow trends over time shows you if things are improving or not. It's useful to test other people's opinion against the actual data. This is uh, what we call a runtime chart, and we use it to capture flow time. So the vertical axis here is the number of days that it took to complete a work item. And the horizontal axis is the actual date that the work was completed. So we're looking at the month of September here, and it's sort of divided into weeks. You can see four weeks in the month of September. There's a legend on the right that shows the kind of demand. We've got what I call revenue generation kinds of work. Um, that is, that's feature work. Uh, and that's actually all that's showing on this chart. We filtered it on revenue generation. So it's just showing that type of work. Although you'll see the pink circles there, those are where something got delivered to production and it caused some kind of failure, you know, an escape defect. Um, we call that failure demand. And so we can see that the first two weeks of September, all the work completed in 10 days or less. Right? And then in week three, the flow time increased to about 15 days. And then in week four, it jumps up to 20 days. So seeing this data, it, it should prompt a discussion on why things took longer to complete toward the end of the month. And we don't really know yet from looking at this data, but it prompts the right questions. You know, what happened so that we can start investigating and learning more? This kind of chart, 
also help set expectations for how long things might take next month. Right, so the small blue dots you see each week, like the first week you see the small blue dots are 8.7. That's the 90th percentile, right? What, what we're trying to do with flow time is answer this question, what's the probability of completing work in so many days? And here we're using the 90th percentile. So based on this data, we could say that 90% of the time feature requests take no longer than 20 days if you look at all the data across the month. If you use the 50th percentile, which is just the average, then uh, that, well, then it doesn't help your estimates much because they'll be wrong at least half of the time. There's this book called The Flaw of Averages and the opening cartoon is a picture of a six foot tall statistician and he's drowning in a lake with an average depth of three feet. So be careful about using averages to estimate your work. See if you can filter your data and or calculate, you know, the 75th percentile or 80th percentile or, you know, 90th percentile if you need a high confidence level. So that's what flow metrics uh, can show you. And depending on your tool functionality, you can configure settings or, or filter in different percentiles, and this is going to help you be more predictable. The idea here is we're trying to be exact, we're trying to be approximately right instead of exactly wrong. But we don't have the whole story here. There's something else going on. And that is, we've got a bunch of unplanned work. So same chart, but we've added the other kinds of work item types. So not only do you see revenue generation kind of work on here, the, the features that business people requested, we see revenue protection kind of work, and we see unplanned work. The yellow triangles represent the unplanned work. When I talk about revenue protect, protect, the protection, I'm talking about fixing security vulnerabilities and doing service pack, patches and maintenance and keeping the lights on, all the work that we need to do to maintain a system once it's in production. Well, if three emergencies pop up, you know, like during the second week of September, then the planned work is likely going to be delayed. Unplanned work delays planned work. This is thief un unplanned work sneaking in. It's stealing time away from planned work. So you see that purple arrow on the chart? It's pointing at a feature that had been estimated to be delivered the week before, but because of all the planned work, it delayed, uh, because of all the unplanned work, it delayed that feature by one week. Right? If you're tracking unplanned work, it's gonna show up in a chart like this. If you're not tracking it, then it's invisible and it's hard to manage invisible work. So keep in mind here that um, what we measure impacts people, right? Tell me how you're going to measure me and I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. And if, once, so I was at a conference once and I overheard somebody ask a vendor, does your speed metrics, you know, can you calculate lead time but exclude weekends? And I couldn't help myself. I had to ask, why do you want to exclude weekends? And they said, well, our merit reviews are based on these, um, on these targets to reduce our lead time. <laughs> and so this is how people can gain speed metrics. Whether you call it cycle time or lead time or, or, or flow time, keep in mind that this metric is the duration. It has a start date and an end date. Like it doesn't stop for the weekend. And that's because we're speaking to the business. We're setting expectations of when they can tell customers that things will be done. And if they say that we will get this done in 30 days, they're expecting 30 days from now, right? They're not saying 30 days minus weekends and holidays, right? It's, it's the elapsed duration of time that we need to keep in mind. So um, another way that you can game a speed metric is to only pull in small, you know, simple work items into your work queues that can get done faster. 
So having discussions with your teams on how people can gain the metrics, it's, it's a useful, it's an interesting exercise to help bring some transparency to the, re to the reality of the situation. So to sum up flow time benefits uh, before moving on, flow time helps people understand why work was delayed and they can see what else competes with planned work. It helps people understand time to market for completing items and to help them see where bottlenecks are and look for ways to reduce waste and unnecessary steps. This chart, by the way, is part of an exercise I created on how to calculate flow metrics. I call it the balance flow chart exercise, and I'll give you a link to it at the end of the talk. And it was very much inspired by Troy McGinnis and Larry Matcheroni. Uh, they've done a lot of work in this area. They have a blog called uh, Doing Team Metrics Right, and I put a link there at the bottom. I find it helpful to compare metrics all on one page. And so that was sort of my goal uh, with this, with this uh, chart here. All right, next up is flow velocity. So flow velocity is a measure of productivity. This is your throughput, right? This answers the question, how many work items got done? Extremely easy to calculate. I've borrowed uh, the visual that Linkit uses uh, when they uh, present uh, what they call throughput, what is also called flow velocity. So for the first week of September, you can see that the throughput was seven. You're just totaling up the number of items that were completed that week. And these are actual work items. We're creating real work. These aren't story points. This is actual work, business value that is flowing through your value stream. In the second week, you see there's three items that got completed. The third week, there were three items that got completed. And then on the last week, there's four items that were completed. Why do we measure it? Because tracking flow velocity over time is going to provide some good historical data for teams to see the delivery rates. And then they can you know, use this to help improve their estimates or their forecasting for how much work they can deliver. So flow velocity gets gained by breaking work down into smaller bits, which is not necessarily a bad thing, and I'll show you why in a minute. But you can experiment with the relationship between flow time and flow velocity, right? You can ask, you, ask the question, does flow velocity improve with faster flow time? Or does it diminish when flow time increases? So if capturing in visualizing these flow metrics, then you can start to see possible correlation, right? We only delivered three feature work items this week, and it took five days longer than the previous week. This kind of information isn't so easy to detect uh, in a spreadsheet. So my advice is to leave the spreadsheets to the accountants and start making your metrics visible in a way that is easy for the human eye to comprehend. So here's why breaking your work down into smaller bits may not be a problem. Imagine you go shopping for bananas. If you buy a six month supply of bananas, your transaction cost is low, but most of the bananas will be rotten in a week. So you're gonna waste money. If you buy a one day supply of bananas, your bananas won't rot, but the transaction costs are gonna be high because you have to go to the grocery store every day. So somewhere in the middle, is the right batch size. So there's two things to consider with batch size. There's transaction costs and holding costs. In knowledge work, holding costs go up with large batch sizes because of all the dependencies and late feedback and code merges. Large dependencies have high holding costs because the software isn't, you're not getting any value from it yet. It's like the Frosted Flakes on the shelf at the grocery store. They're just sitting on the shelf. Nobody's bought them yet. Nobody can consume it yet. So it, all the work you've done to build it and test it and automate it and deliver it isn't seen, it's not realizing any value yet. This is different with manufacturing. 
where transaction costs go down with large batch size projects. I mean, if you look at book publishing, book publishers, they don't just print one book, right? they print hundreds or thousands of books and ship out large batch sizes at a time. So the assumptions about economies of scale rarely apply to software development work. A small quick deploy goes a long way toward recovering quickly if you need to, which is why managing by value stream is a better way to go. And you know, project-oriented management models tend to incentivize large batch size because of the capitalization of software development. Um, so have a think about managing by product instead of project. All right, number three is flow efficiency. So this is a measure to expose all the wait time to understand how much wait time is actually in your system. It's the percentage of the time that work is in an active state, when you're actually doing something, you're writing code or you're testing or you're automating your work or you're designing something, you're doing something creative. So it's this ratio of where um, of the difference between where work is in an active state versus a wait state. And there's the equation there, work over weight plus work times 100% equals flow efficiency. We measure it because it helps teams see just how much wait time is in the system and then make decisions about what to do about it. In general, that's what we're trying to do with all our metrics. We're using metrics to help us make better decisions. And so often, you know, much of flow time is simply wait time. If you're lucky, your flow efficiency is gonna be over 15%, but 5% is very common. And often the emphasis is on estimating how long things will take. And that's assuming that there's no interruptions or dependencies. But that's, uh, you know, that's usually not the case. Right, you got you work, and then you wait, then you work, then you wait. And what this illustration is trying to show is that flow efficiency needs somehow for you to identify the wait states in your workflow design. Otherwise, it's very hard to track how much of your time was actually wait time. So in this example, we've got a backlog with a whole bunch of stuff in it, which I like to call the backlog the backlog options because you might do them, you might not. They're options. Business people understand the word options, right? It means, you know, depending on the value or the return on investment or the potential revenue generation that ex that's expected, they might not do some of the stuff in the backlog. And that's one another reason why we start the clock later when it comes to flow time. You might not ever get to this stuff in the backlog. And so then it goes into an investigate state. You know, maybe we have questions around design, like how much design capacity is there? What's the capacity of the design team? We need to go investigate that. Uh, we need to prioritize it against all the other requests. Um, and, but then before it moves into done, it sort of sits in this investigate done state and it's just sitting there idle, waiting. It's waiting on when development has capacity to pull that work into their, their work queues. And same on, you know, then development is done and then maybe it sits in a development done state before something else is needed, whether ops has to do something with it or you need feedback on it. These are the wait states. So we're bringing visibility to when work, we're watching the work here. We say watch the work, not the people. Is the work idle, right? That's gonna, decrease your flow efficiency, it's going to make your flow time longer. Whatever the states are in your value stream, flow efficiency requires you to identify when this work sits idle, but it can be a challenge for a lot of tools to do this, um, except for real Kanban tools. Hey, Dominica, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, when we're talking about wait time versus that active state, what about kind of those times in between where say, um, you know, for, for example, a lot of times if I'm writing something, I'll have to kind of 
get up and walk away and, and put my mind on something else for like 10 minutes or so before I go back to finish what I'm doing, just to kind of let, you know, kind of ideas marinate, if you will. Um, sure. And do you, would you consider that a wait time or an active state? Well, you know, I wouldn't move something into a wait state if it was only 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, this is, a policy you've just asked me what's our policy for moving something into a wait state and for me i like to get something to i like to work on something and get it to a point where i it's easy for me to come back to or i can hand it off to somebody and if that's going to be you know another day or two then i probably put it in a wait state okay all right. So, so that would be something that would be up to the individual company or organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's up to the team to have that conversation. Um, there's a balance here of the information that's going to be valuable for us to know versus the the overhead of of moving things, um, mm -hmm. weight states, and and whatnot. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So. Just, here's an example of, you know, some tools allow you to set a work item to be blocked, but then it it just aggregates all the blocked items and items into one queue like, to the right of the board, and so then you lose visibility of which state the work was actually in when it got blocked. I mean, it's better than nothing. At least it lets people know that work is in a wait state. Um, but also the word blocked sometimes is met with a strong emotional reaction and people don't like to set work to blocked and move it all the way over to the right side of the board because they're fearful of you know making their teammate look bad i was at an organization once where work was blocked but it wasn't getting moved to block or set to blocked for fear of you know being reprimanded or or fear of being called out and so I think the word wait, and if you have all your wait states between your different queues is a much more acceptable uh, way to look at, at work, right? I, I tend to think of blocked as help, like this needs to be escalated. We need leadership to escalate this. Our house is on fire and, uh, and we need action on this immediately. That's when I would consider something blocked. Um, so when you design, you know, consider when you design your Kanban boards, where is your bottleneck? It's likely going to have a big weight queue in front of it. But if all the work is moved, you know, to the right side of the board, it's going to diminish the benefit of visualizing the bottleneck. So the benefit of flow efficiency is that it helps teams see the weight in the system, where work gets stuck. You can visualize bottlenecks so you can do something about it. And also don't fret if you or your friend are the bottleneck. It's, it's how you can begin to get the help you need. When I managed the build and release team at Corbis, we didn't have automated testing and it took a long time to do all these manual smoke tests, especially when functionality was broken. But once I could start to show how long things took, how long builds actually took, people complained that builds took too long. So, okay, let's measure how long builds take and presented that information. And we recognized that a lot of that time was trying to do these manual smoke tests. Uh, and so once I could present metrics, um, I and shared that with management, I got budget, I got headcount. So keep in mind that if you are the bottleneck, you'll likely get you know, the help that you need if you're working in a good organization. So this is sort of, you know, we're, we're not the worst case scenario, but if if handoffs are happening in email because you're working in different tools, so you're not even working on the same board in the same system, right? And so in order to communicate, you got to go through email and emails go back and forth and back and forth. This example is showing a team that's working in JIRA and another team that's working in Salesforce, but they can't see each other's work. And so there's all these disconnects, all this wait time um, between these emails going back and forth and back and forth. And it interferes with collaboration and it delays delivery. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you still get work requests via email. You know, hopefully that work is being requested via your, your work management system or your, your, um, your flow tool, whatever you're using. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, hopefully you can get that, all that work into a system so you can see your flow, your actual flow efficiency. All right, let's look at flow load. Flow load, we call this work in progress, right? It's a way to measure your, it's a way to see all, you know, the demand that's coming in versus the capacity of the team to work on the demand. Your flow load is all your work in progress. It's all your partially completed work, right? All the work in your tools, all the tickets, all the work that's on your um, post-its surrounding your monitor, all the unplanned work, all your invisible work, right? Um, so why do we measure it? Well, flow load is the primary factor in all the speed metrics, right? Flow time equals work in progress divided by your flow velocity or your throughput. That's Little's law, by the way. And so it's a leading indicator. Right? Whip is a leading indicator. We can measure MTTR and velocity and lead time or cycle time or throughput, but those are all trailing indicators. You don't know how long something took to do until you're done with it. Right? With work in progress, we know almost immediately when we have too much going on that something's going to take longer. High work in progress levels, right? high flow load levels means that other work items sit waiting for service longer kind of like this freeway here. Only so many vehicles fit on the road. The freeway clogs up and slows way down when you hit full capacity. The more cars, the longer they commute. It's the same thing with computers. Right? They stop responding when they get to very high utilization levels. Same thing with people. <laughs> Loading people to 100% capacity utilization makes things take a long time. Right? We don't let our servers get loaded up to 100%. We shouldn't do that to our people either. So the higher the utilization, the longer the wait, especially in areas of high variability like IT, because you've got all this unplanned work, you've got conflicting priorities, you've got unknown dependencies. These are all the time thieves that are coming in still in time for you. So the single most important factor that affects wait time is the queue size. It's, it's the work in progress. And when you look at the math, you can see that wait times increase exponentially when utilization approaches 100%. So this is what queuing theory is all about, right? It's applied statistics that studies waiting times and lines. It's what allows us to quantify the relationship between wait times and capacity utilization. This is something that Gantt charts don't help us do very well, right? Because Gantt charts don't consider the wait times and the block times that occur when people are allocated at high levels. Keeping people busy all the time, it's not efficient, it's not effective, right? Because it causes conflicting priorities and people get overbooked. This is the problem with high utilization levels. Important work takes longer and flow time increases because people aren't available. My teams rarely work in isolation. If a skill set is needed from a different team, then handoffs occur between you know, two different teams. And you know, a developer is wondering, gee, are there any unknown vulnerabilities in this code while they're waiting on feedback from us, the security expert, but the security expert is busy discovering how someone hacked into their now unsecured database. And so a question waits on input from the database architect. You know, is the data in the test environment wrong? Can you please check it out? But the database architect is busy helping the security expert. When you're the only one on the team with a special skill set, you know, you can be a bottleneck pulled in all these conflicting directions. So expert skills and high demand are often unavailable when you need them. And if you have like a self, um, a shared services team, where you have, and maybe you're supporting four different other teams, if they're all trying to 
uh, get help from an uh, expert on your team, the probability of you being late uh, or delivering something late or starting something late is very low, uh, very low indeed, um, the more dependencies you have. So what to do about this? Well, when you look at work like this and you set work in progress limits, you're setting basically flow load limits so you can balance all this demand against capacity. Uh, so on this board, you got a million things in the backlog that are incoming. This is a Kanban board. You could use this at a very high level. You could use this at a team level. Um, and either way, you need to do some form of prioritization. In this example, we're prioritizing the top five items that come through. And then from that, to the right of top five, you see our work in progress limit, uh, which is 10. I'll explain the eight plus two in just a minute. So we have the same legend here as we had on our metrics. Blue is revenue generation. Blue is features, business requests. Green is revenue protection, right? This is the work that Ops is doing to protect production. Productions first, right? And then yellow is unplanned work. Notice there's no yellow in the backlog. Right, yellow, we're lucky if yellow even shows up in our work in progress cues. I call this born and doing, right? Often unplanned work is invisible um, or work will just all of a sudden appear, just show up in your, in your create, create feedback or deliver um, columns, you know, because things change. But basically, we can see competing work items here. We can see work that's sitting and waiting down below, not getting done. And the idea here is to set work in progress limits. So work in progress limits are an enabling constraint. So with Scrum, the constraint is the time limit. It's, it's the length of the sprint. It's two weeks. We're just going to work on what we can do in two weeks. With Kanban, the constraint is the work in progress limit. This is what gives permission for people to say, whoa, wait a minute, like we don't have capacity to take that on right now. Like if this is the new priority one, you know, if yesterday's priority one is not the priority anymore, you know, what should we take off of this board so we can pull in this new priority one? So think of it as a helpful enabling constraint because People have a hard time saying no <laughs> for a variety of reasons. The most common reasons that people say yes, because I ask this question everywhere I go, why do you take on more work than you have capacity to do? And people often say, because the boss asked me, or I don't want to let the team down, or I'm a people pleaser. Um, if you have work in progress limits in place, this is giving people permission to say, I you know, we're at full capacity. You know, it, it provokes a necessary conversation about the teams being overloaded. And keep in mind that it is a primary factor of speed, the amount of work in progress, your, your, your flow load. So if you overload your teams, work is gonna take longer, longer to do. How this is gained. People gain this by doing work under the table. It becomes invisible work. Uh, or, or they else they move it to done when before they're really done with it. Maybe they feel like they should be done with it, like they feel bad because it's not done yet. And so they, they plan on finishing it over the weekend, uh, but setting it to done already. All right, next up is flow distribution. So Keep in mind that a decision to do one thing is a decision to delay something else. So if only features are being worked on, then that means that there's no capacity left over to fix bugs or failures such as defects or risks, which are things like security, compliance, auditing work, or debts, which, which are, is mostly technical debt. So what flow distribution is doing is it's showing you the, the ratio, the proportion of all the work in your value stream 
uh, that is related to one of these four types of work. And these can be adjusted based on the needs of the business strategy. You know, maybe you are putting out a brand new release and you're spending a lot of time on features, but once that release goes out, now you need to spend more time working on defects or, or perhaps uh, technical debt. So the ratio of features might shift back and be, it be less. It helps people, it helps teams have this important conversation. And one of the biggest complaints I hear from teams, particularly in IT ops, that they don't have time to do their internal team improvements or in development. We don't have time to fix technical debt because we have all these feature requests that we need to be working on. Well, capturing flow distribution lets you have, helps you have that conversation with product owners and business people. You see, we need their approval to prioritize doing technical debt. We need them to start to see the trade-offs uh, that we're going to get if we spend some time working on internal team improvements and fixing, fixing technical debt. So the benefit is you can begin to see how work is really allocated. How this is gained, uh, well, we see, um, I mean, depending on the context, how this is gained. So let me show you another um, slide here on how we can visualize this. So one way to visualize this on your Kanban is to have a horizontal row for or a different color for each type of work. So in here, the uh, features are blue, defects are orange, risks are pink, and depths are green. And we've set width limits, work in progress limits for each of that kind of work distribution. So the team were saying at this point in time, the strategy of uh, what we need to do with this value stream right now is we can work on five features at a time, five defects at a time. We can pull one risk in and three debts. Um, that'd be technical debts. And, but if things keep getting reprioritized and new features keep getting pushed on the team and it gets to be over five, you're going to see that in a visual like this. And that starts the conversation like, wait a minute, like you can't expect us to fix technical debt if you keep shoving all these new features on this. And this is something that IT and the business need to understand, right? If you do more feature work, you can't expect that it won't take away from doing risk work. But if you're categorizing your work items and you can visualize them in progress, you can use whip limits to allocate capacity. The main thing is just make the trade-offs clear and how it helps set strategic direction. So as I said before, a decision to do one thing is a decision to delay something else. And you can help others see the impacts of conflicting priorities. Um, this is a sample dashboard showing all the flow metrics. And this is from the flow framework that is in a new book that is going to be released on November 20th. It's called Project to Product by Mick Kirsten. It's how to survive and thrive in the age of digital disruption with the flow framework. Mick Kirsten did a talk about this at the DOES conference two weeks ago in Las Vegas. I put a link to um, his talk. It's the Go uh, Testtop.com WAP DevOps Enterprise Summit. Actually, that's the link to all of our talks. My talk is up there too, along with Carmen Diardo's talk and Nicole Bryan's. And, um, but you'll see Mick's talk up there. His talk is the number one viewed talk on Utah, YouTube. It has over a thousand hits more than any other talk. So I encourage you to go watch that presentation and check out um, his book there. Uh, what we're showing here is the flow distribution. See how features are you know, going up and down and the number of defects and risks and debts are going up and down over time. This lets you see the distribution of the type of work that the teams are, are doing and allows you to 
uh, allocate capacity for that. You can see flow velocity, flow um, efficiency here, and this example is 23%, which is very, very good. Um, we also are showing the flow time average here, uh, 15 days, but there's an arrow where you can see that that's actually increased. And then flow load, the amount of work in progress that the teams have, and that's showing the percentage that that increased. I want to point out the business value metrics over on the right, particularly on the one in the bottom called business happiness. Um, oh, sorry, before I go there, I just want to say that in my experience, metrics have been invaluable to get the leadership agreement and buy-in because I used to rant about how long it took to do smoke tests, that we didn't have any automated testing. And then when I started to present metrics in a calm way, you know, I, I, I was just, I was overwhelmed. I was just amazed at the reaction from people. So if you want to convince other folks that might be suffering some misconception, it's useful to test their opinion against the data. People listen to data. It helps with credibility. It, it helps you be the voice of reason in your organization. Right? I mean, somebody's going to influence the boss, so it might as well be you. So back to the happiness uh, metric. So I lied. I said there were going to be five, but I'm actually going to show you a few more. We do this at Task Top. We have a metric to gauge happiness, and it's just one question on a net promoter score. How likely are you to recommend working for this company to a friend? And if the results from, oh, and there's also then an open, um, open box question where you, could, you can say, like, why did you answer this question this way? But it's optional. So this can be a leading indicator to see if employees are unhappy. You know, maybe they're unhappy because they've got too much work in progress loaded on them and they don't have any capacity to do their own internal team improvements. We also um, use this metric from a DevOps perspective to measure safety. And I have a link there from Nicole Forsgren's talk at DevOps Day Seattle in 2015, uh, where she talks about some example questions you could use to determine the level of safety. Often teams are unhappy because they don't feel um, safe in their organization. There was a talk at Does, it's up on YouTube already, by Dr. Christina Maslow, where she presented her research on burnout and, and job stress in her talk. It's called Understanding Job Burnout. And one of the top things on the list to help improve it was a sustainable workload. Well, that's, our, that's the flow load metric. That's the work in progress. So if people are unhappy or feel like they're burnt out, then you can look at, um, the correlation between this happiness metric and your flow load metrics. Another report I think is vital for teams to look at is the aging report. Anybody can do this typically. Just query your ticketing system, show me everything, all, you know, everything partially completed. You know, not, not the backlog, not the stuff that's done, but everything in between. Show me everything that hasn't been touched in 30 days. This example is showing 10 days with no activity. But if that returns a humongous long list, then bump that number up. You know, maybe you need to show 60 days or 90 days. And that list alone, when you see all the amount of idle work that's just sitting in your system, that's a red flag for you. And with that, um, I think I'm just, I'm recognizing time and I want to save time for questions. So I'm going to um, jump ahead just to reiterate this point about the flow metrics. The goal is to bring visibility to business outcomes. Right? Are we more predictable this quarter than last quarter? What's the probability of delivering a new feature when needed? Right? There's a desire to look at real business outcomes over activity-based metrics like lines of code. Right. Lines of code, the number of lines of code, 
they incentivize people to bloat their development. I mean, it could be that 10 lines of code might be a better solution than a thousand lines of code, right? Business people, I mean, they don't care really about the lines of code, right? They don't care about story points or containers or Kubernetes. What they care about is did the customers get the changes they needed when we promised it to them, right? Is this change that we're putting out going to generate revenue or is it going to make us more secure? Like, how can we be more predictable? That's the language of the business. Teams, I heard this top uh, quote by Paul Shepard last week, and I just love it. Teams are not paid to deliver software. They are paid to deliver impact from which value can be delivered. Right. I wanna uh, leave you with some information on our conference uh, in Washington, D.C. on December 6th. It's, our, it's gonna be at the Knight Conference Center at the museum in Washington, D.C. It's our second annual conference. And it's a great place to learn more about the Flow Framework and to meet other people who are also trying to use Flow metrics. We've got speakers lined up from Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and Nationwide and Deloitte. Um, and there'll be talks um, basically on how how they're working with their value stream and digital transformations, you know, how they scale initiatives across their value streams. And Mick Kirsten is going to give a talk on the flow framework and project to product. Carmen Diardo and I are going to talk about applying flow metrics to your value stream. I'll probably be talking more about flow metrics. Basically, it's a way to meet and talk with other enterprise IT leaders, and we would love to see you there. And then lastly, I want to, if you send me an email at dominica at senderslides.com and put flow in the subject, you'll get an automatic reply with a bunch of goodies. Although, although DevOps.com is going to send you out a copy of this webinar doc. Uh, if you click on this now, you'll get, what you'll get is a link to the presentation that I gave at um, DevOps Enterprise Summit in Las Vegas two weeks ago. So look for the copy of the presentation I just gave from DevOps.com. But what you will get, I'll send you excerpts of my book, Making Work Visible, and we'll send you a video on tool integration. That's what we do at TaskTop. It's one of the reasons I joined TaskTop because they are solving the problem of invisible connections and making it work visible. And so there's a video on, well, how do we integrate Jira with um, ServiceNow? And then there's also a Forrester article on value stream management. If you haven't heard about that, um, not often you get a free Forrester article, so here you go. And then as well as a, a paper that I just um, worked with IT Revolution and other folks like Scott Pru uh, in overcoming inefficiencies in our management systems. And so that's it for me. I um, hope you enjoyed the talk and continue, encourage you to continue on your flow journey. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Charlene. Okay, great. We do have, uh, we've got about seven minutes uh, left, so we'll go ahead and dive right on into the questions. But before we do, just want to remind the audience, if you have a question for Dominica, go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel, submit your questions. We have time for maybe two or three of them. First one, um, uh, let's see, going back to the wait time conversation, do weekends and holidays count as wait time? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so flow time is the elapsed time. That's the time that the business cares about. It is, we do not want to exclude uh, weekends and holidays from our flow time metrics, right? That's how metrics get gained in the system. I mean, it, um, I, w I say with a caveat, though, if you have work that is only going to take you an hour to do <laughs> um, and it goes over a weekend, that might be the exception. But in general, you know, we're talking about enterprise IT um, work here. If you're working on feature requests that, you know, may take 
20, 30, 40 days or or longer, then no, weekends don't count as wait time. Okay. All right, great. Uh, let's see, next question. Um, uh, somebody's asking about the book. Um, what was the name of the book again? Uh, project, 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 to project to Product. How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with the Flow Framework by Mick Kirsten. It's available for pre-order. Just go to uh, Amazon and you can pre-order it. I've got mine pre-ordered. I'm hoping that I get it on November 20th. Sometimes if you pre-order books, you get them a little bit earlier. Okay. All right, great. And let's see, the next question. Um, so uh, let's see, H how do we get started with flow metrics? Uh, it says we have a lot of metrics already, such as burn down charts, number of deploys per day, mean time to uh, re re resolution, et cetera. So uh, what's the next step, I guess? <laughs> yeah. So a great way to get started with flow metrics is to do an experiment. Exper you know, when you use the word experiment, it it help it puts you in a safe place, right? Because uh, an experiment, I mean, it, it might work well, it might not work well, but it helps, you know, usually you can get support to do an experiment. And then I would look for what I call the coalition of the willing. Find <laughs> somebody, <laughs> on the business side who is interested in having a better view of metrics that matter to them. And there's some good experience reports out there. Uh, there's a video of, out by Capital One with Amy Bechtel. It's up on YouTube too, if you're searching for all the DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, videos. And she's talking, so she, she leads uh, the networking group in IT at Capital One. And she wasn't getting capacity to do technical debt. Uh, she was having a hard time. Well, she found some, she found a director of product uh, management on the business side uh, who was willing, um, you know, just you know, saw the path that she wanted to go, saw a benefit in there, and was willing to support her on that. So see if you can find somebody from the business side who recognizes the value that they're going to get out of flow metrics and just conduct an experiment. And when others start to see your success, you know, they're going to want to join the party too. All right, great. Um, let's see, we're three minutes to Yeah. Um, yeah, this is the problem with overloaded teams. And so if you are fully utilized, then the, the first thing is to make the work visible, right? Make the pain visible, make the pain points visible. Start showing that the reason your work is late is because priorities changed or new work got pushed onto you, um, or you had all this unplanned work arrive and you had to drop your planned work to, to work on that. Find a way to make that visible so that you can help others see the problem. When you know, there's something happens when people see a visual, you know, I'm not talking about a spreadsheet or a Gantt chart. I mean, like a real visual of your Kanban board or your data or your, your metrics. Um, help people you know, look at the visual so that they can, you can talk. What happens, I see this over and over again, when there's a visual there and both of you are standing on the same side of the visual, looking at the visual, like the metrics, then they become the thing that needs to be changed. It's not a us versus them thing. It's how do we help our work Smoke, uh, flow smoother and more predictably across this value stream. Um, next, I would ask leaders to go ahead and send out that net promoter score survey. See what they get back on that. Maybe they just don't realize the impact on the teams. You know, I mean, leaders and managers, they're just trying to get their work done too. 
Um, but often, you know, as humans, we don't realize the impact to others if we're not in their shoes. So a uh, net promoter score on employee happiness can help them see that. Uh, and then you know, lastly, if you're just um, really unhappy, you know, maybe you need to vote with your feet if you don't see any opportunity for change. Okay. All right. And with that, we do need to close out the question and answer period. Um, I want to thank everybody who did submit questions and um, want to remind the audience also that today's event is being was recorded. So uh, if you missed any or all of it, you will have the opportunity to visit uh, to watch the website on, sorry, watch the webinar on demand. Um, the webinar also will be living uh, on the devops.com website under the webinar section. So if you um, don't receive the link in email that I uh, mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, you will be able to actually get to the webinar on the devops.com website. Um, uh, again, thanks, uh, Dominica, for such a great presentation. Really appreciate it. It's, uh, you always have such really fascinating information. So yeah. I know I got a lot out of it. So thanks very much. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, thank you. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.